Good morning, everyone. Morning. I hope you can you can all hear me okay. Okay. Good morning and welcome from a rather frosty Vienna to a third Translating Europe workshop belonging to the From Translation to Accessibility series. Uh, today's event is dedicated to translation and accessibility in the cultural and institutional sectors. My name is Alina Sekara. I am a senior scientist at the University of Vienna Center for Translation Studies. I am a white woman of slim belt in early 40s. I wear glasses and have short brown hair. I am presenting from my office in Vienna, and I am using as background the University of Vienna blue on white logo. Uh, it is really, really wonderful to see so many of you online today. And I would like to thank you for taking the time to be here, whether you are a speaker or an audience member, an organizer, um, a member of staff at a university, cultural institution, a practitioner, a user of translation and accessibility services, or simply an interested citizen. You are all very, very welcome. This event is organized by the Center for Translation Studies at the University of Vienna, or CTV as we call it, together with the Directorate General for Translation of the European Commission, DGT, the Vienna Field Office, and in collaboration with five other EMT universities, so the European Masters in Translation Universities, namely the Constantine the Philosopher University in Nitra, Slovakia, the Kaunas University of Technology in Lithuania, University of Porto in Portugal, University of Rome in Italy, and University of Antwerp in Belgium. I would like to thank all my colleagues for their effort and help in putting this event together. I would like now to pass the floor to my colleague, Professor Gerhard Budin, to officially open the event. Okay, thank you, Alina. Welcome to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you. I'm the deputy head of the Center for Translation Studies. Our head, Professor Kadrich, is not available today, but she sends her kindest uh, greetings to all of you. And we are proud of, of having Alina uh, as a real specialist in this field of accessibility and translation. Um, and uh, thanks to your initiative together with the field office of the European Translation uh, Directorate uh, of the European Commission and the five universities you mentioned. Uh, it's a, a real pleasure to have these Translation Europe workshops so it's the third in this series, I understand. And uh, the Center for Translation Studies, for us, uh, this uh, topic of accessibility is uh, of strategic importance because it is a contribution to a more inclusive society as translation in its traditional form as well. But uh, we try to enhance the also teaching of accessibility methods in our translators training in bachelor, master, and in doctoral programs. So this is uh, of really uh, strategic importance to us. And we are very proud of all of you. And uh, I've, I've seen also research going on. Um, so it's, it's really important to combine research practitioners and teaching uh, in, this, in this field. So have a, a successful workshop this, uh, this day and uh, all the best to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind welcome. Um, and also a thank you to, to my Center for Translation Studies Department for the support <clears throat> provided in organizing this event. Um, I would also like to thank a few Vienna colleagues. Um, so to Barbara berger Kuklich for the administrative support, to Matthias Kerber for the technical support, and to Dragos Ciobano for his input in the program and for monitoring the chat uh, and interactions today. Um, speaking of key people, next I would like to introduce Claudia Kropf from the Directorate General for Translation, the Vienna Field Office, really without whom this event would, could not have taken place. Uh, it is thanks to Claudia's great support and encouragement that we are here today. Um, and she also has a few words of welcome. Claudia, please. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Alina. I'm very happy uh, to be here today. And um, it's not because of me, <laughs> but because of your great organization and because of our services uh, translating Europe program that this workshop can happen today. But thank you very much. Um, my name is Claudia. I'm a translator in the translating service of the European Commission. I'm a white woman in my 30s and I'm wearing glasses and I have the Translating Europe background today, which is orange on white. Um, we're having this Translating Europe project, the European Commission, to bring together the language industry, the academia, professionals, experts in, in the language field, um, and to exchange what is going on in, in the field, what are trends, what do we need in training, what do freelancers need, what do um, public translation services need. And these workshops are part of this Translating Europe project. Um, we're also organizing a forum every autumn. The last one in November 2022 was about accessibility. And um, it's a very important topic that I think needs more visibility, more awareness. Um, we in the Commission still need to learn a lot about this topic. So I'm also very much looking forward to the sessions today. And yes, um, I think we can only um, learn from each other if we do projects like this. So I'm very happy that so many universities have teamed up um, for today. And maybe just one more organizational info from my side. We will do a Slido survey throughout the day. I will post the link in the chat in just a second. And we will also show you the QR code during the breaks and the event code. If you are about to leave the event, um, please maybe take a minute to fill in the survey. We would be very happy to hear from you how you liked it and if we can improve or... Yes, um, and one more request to the speakers. Um, First of all, thank you very much for your time today. And then second of all, I will be trying to live tweet a little bit during the event. So if you want, you can send me your Twitter handles by private message and I will mention you on Twitter. So enjoy the day and thank you very much again, Alina and um, Professor Boudin for organizing this workshop today with us. Thank you, Claudia, um, and thank you <clears throat> again both for your welcome messages. Um, as as mentioned at the beginning, this is the third cross border workshop in the in the series of from translation to accessibility EMT train the trainer summer school. We call them summer school at, at the beginning. Uh, I think we had this idea that uh, we would all meet together in the sun somewhere and and learn from each other. But then, you know, the the pandemic kind of messed that hold up so we are still online but hopefully the fourth uh, one will be a summer school somewhere sunny um, and really this series took shape as part of the European Masters in Translation um, and more specifically within its audiovisual translation and media accessibility working group uh, so wonderfully led by our colleague Emilia Perez from NITRA and it was really Emilia's idea to start a series of workshops, particularly aimed at audiovisual translation and accessibility for practitioners, for trainers, but also for students. And then a consortium was formed with these six universities, the um, <clears throat> Nitra, Kaunas, Porto, Rome, Antwerp, and Vienna. And then this consortium was kindly supported and funded by the Director General for Translation of the European Commission via the Translating Europe workshop scheme. Um, the first event was led by Nitra and took place uh, in June 2021. And it focused on technologies and practices in audiovisual translation and media accessibility training. The second was on audiovisual translation workflows and the role of automation. And it was led by the University of Rome in May 2022. And you can find the recordings uh, on the dedicated uh, Translating Europe workshop uh, YouTube channel if you want, in, in case you weren't there and if you want to, uh, to view those two. And now it is Vienna's turn. 
as I said before, it's still an online event, but this time it's dedicated to translation and accessibility in the cultural sector. I am very pleased to be able to host this event. As, as a researcher and accredited theater captioner, I have a particular interest in this field. I have been researching and working with theaters, looking to enhance their accessibility agenda and services for a few years. And I was therefore particularly happy that colleagues that I worked with over the years or new colleagues interested in this area so enthusiastically accepted my invitation to speak today. A big thank you to you all. As mentioned on the event website, this event invites you to find answers to some questions and beyond those questions. But the questions that were listed on the, on the website were things like, how does a theater director approach accessibility? You know, how does this accessibility look like beyond the, the academia? Which linguistic challenges need to be tackled during an international theater festival? Um, can a strategy document be translated into child-friendly language and also with children as, as um, helpers during the linguistic task? Um, can audio description enhance an online guided tour experience, not only for the initial target audience, but for all? And what are best practices for integrating integrated audio description and dance performances? How does a trainer set up successful collaborations with the cultural sector? Because we're always talking about how can we have more collaborations in the academia with the outside world? Um, so, and in addition to these, I really hope that we will have many, many more questions from you. Um, and I'm looking forward to our interactions throughout the day. And it was always the aim of this event to have a mixed format. So to have presentations, demonstrations, case studies, and also exercises. So we'll try to have all of these uh, throughout the day and to expose all participants to voices from different professional backgrounds. So today we have, in addition to academics, a freelance translator and interpreter, a theater director, two EU staff colleagues, and an industry representative to give presentations. So I hope that will be an interesting mix for, for all of you. Please feel free to interact with us during the event. Um, also, as Claudia was saying, uh, please also give us uh, your, your Twitter handles if you want us to include us in our, in our tweets. Please use the, the chat area, which will be monitored throughout the day. Um, and please feel free to, to ask questions, comments. You are amongst colleagues and all, uh, all comments and questions are gratefully received. Um, last but not, by not least, the, the sessions will be recorded and subsequently made available on the Translating Europe Workshop YouTube channel, so you can re-watch them if you want. Um, we have built in short breaks after each talk um, and hope that these will make us have a more comfortable uh, day, even if online. <clears throat> So I hope I have tempted your translation and accessibility appetite enough to attend a few, if not all of the sessions today. And I wish you a productive and enjoying participation in this event. And <clears throat> we... Sorry, Alina, I was, I was wondering um, because, hello everyone. Um, and because we still have 15 minutes until uh, the program kicks off, Shall we start uh, with uh, with another cheeky Slido in addition to Claudia's um, to find out roughly uh, what the experience in the group is and what the expectations are uh, from today? Um, and also, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Twitter enthusiasts who already uh, have uh, are typing uh, more or less furiously, I'm sure, in, uh, in good cheer. Um, and to say that we propose to use the hashtag uh, TEW underscore access as the hashtag for today. And uh, Claudia uh, will be tweeting Angela also, it seems, and um, perhaps uh, others as well. Um, so uh, in order to find out uh, what the expectations are and also what the experience is with the topic of today, um, perhaps, 
we could all take a couple of minutes to share some thoughts and then I'll share the screen and uh, we can see as a group where we are. So I'll uh, summarize, I'll, I'll do a running commentary, although uh, I know of colleagues who are much better at commenting live, um, but we have a mix of AVD trainers uh, with access, accessibility and cultural sector uh, interests. Uh, we have students of translation studies who are uh, interested and in, they have seen the topic um, being addressed at prior events as well. Uh, we have trainers and experts, uh, we have translators, um, we have postdocs um, specializing in museum audio description, for instance. Uh, we have a Marie Curie fellow um, and uh, with, with a specialization in sign language interpreted music for accessibility purposes. Um, we have participants who are interested in the topic, but uh, don't have much experience yet, but a lot of curiosity. Let's see, let's see. Uh, more master's students ongoing as well as uh, recently uh, graduated. Uh, we have live uh, audio describers uh, for the theater and teachers of related topics such as localization. Mm. More sign language interpreters. Really nice, nice mix. I'm sure the, the Q and A's after each presentation will be super lively. Uh, we've got trainers in digital accessibility. Uh, other people, everyone's profiles is super impressive. Uh, just reading the comments. Um, translators, subtitlers, and also uh, doing a PhD in film festival subtitling. Uh, we have teachers of languages um, with particular interest in interpreting and translation. Wow. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, and that's that's quite a a nice um, a nice mix. Um, so I hope there will be at least something, if not more things, uh, really useful and, and interesting for, for all of you today. Thank you. Um, we oh, we're going to I, sorry. Please. I've just noticed that uh, we have a translation student who's writing the uh, thesis right now, and would appreciate any ideas. So, yes, please share all your pain points and also what you think would be interesting research topics. And at least one grateful soul will be forever in your debt. I'm sure. But I think there will be 78 others also equally grateful. Sorry, Alina, please. Thank you. So now all the presenters are furiously changing the last slide with, <laughs> you know, and this would, would make a, a wonderful research question. Exactly. Further research should look into X, Y, and Z. Uh, maybe not. Thank you. Thank you, Dragos. Um, and thank you all for your uh, for your messages. 
Um, so we will start the day with a with a presentation by Camelia Wana, who is a Romanian accredited translator and interpreter, and who really generously opened the doors for me and for Dragos to an international performing arts festival in Romania and enabled us to experience firsthand how linguists, creative teams, technicians, and front of house need to come together to deliver successfully the stories that the artists and creators want the public to experience. She will share some of those stories with us today. Um, she has quite a lot of stories and probably not enough time to, uh, to, tell, us, <laughs> to tell us everything. Um, and the um the 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 topic the the title of her presentation is managing interlingual communication for an international performing arts festival kami the the floor is yours and and thank you i made you co-host so you can <laughs> thank you just before i begin uh, i'd like to share some slides and uh somebody to please confirm whether you can see them and hopefully you won't be able to see my notes two can you see them let's see i should be in slideshow view now and let me just check for the presenter view which is perfectly hidden by now can you see my notes no can you see my notes now no, no? Oh, but okay. i assume that's, that's a good thing <laughs> yeah yeah that's a great thing <laughs> okay All right. Good. So thank you so much, Alina, for passing me the floor and for the invitation, first and foremost, and uh, congrats for organizing these kinds of events. Uh, before I begin, I'm a white woman in my 30s wearing glasses. And as a background, I have my beautiful blue wall, um, which hopefully I never, I never paint over <laughs> because it makes such a great uh, for such a great uh, background. And before I go into any other details and into my presentation, I would like to ask you all, let me open my chat and see, uh, you could maybe reply to me in the chat. Do you remember what you were doing on the 4th of September, 2020? It's a trick question, of course. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I had to look a little bit for the date. It's true. I really had to. Um, I can share the slides. Sure. I'll just get up for Lucia. I'll just uh, delete my notes and I can share the slides. Okay, Dragos was getting ready to move to Vienna. Not a bad, not a bad place to be, right, Dragos? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll, uh, I'll wait for your answers in the chat. And in the meantime, not to, to waste time, I will tell you what I was doing on the 4th of September, 2020. I'll start with a little story. As you can probably see from the screen, I was at my at the seaside. We were in the first, I think it was the first year of the pandemic. So I was in the Romanian at the Romanian seaside because you couldn't really travel internationally. And uh, you know, a little bit of a sea breeze. My mind was finally at ease. You you'll find out soon enough why <laughs> I say finally. And I remember we were sitting on distanced towels, and uh, but not distanced enough so that I couldn't overhear. I really wasn't eavesdropping. I just happened to overhear a woman talk to somebody about how she was a fan of culture and how, despite of all the, the disadvantages that the pandemic came with, she was very happy to discover that a lot of the international uh, cultural um, institutions had opened their gates virtually, of course, to all audiences by posting or streaming a lot of their shows online. And among the institutions that she mentioned was uh, the Sibiu International Theatre Festival, which is a Romanian festival. Um, and she seemed somewhat uh, positively surprised that the festival had subtitled all the shows into Romanian and English or Romanian or English, depending on, uh, on the, the uh, source language. Why was this interesting to me? Well, because I had been in charge of the whole translation subtitling that year, only subtitling um, mission. And now I will 
move on with my slides. Hopefully it worked. Yeah. So I have been the coordinator of uh, of this uh, of the translation. I can call it a department, although it's not really a department. Translation, interpretation, super titling, and then once the pandemic hit, subtitling um, of the Siberia National Theatre Festival. But I'm basically a translator and an interpreter myself, and I just happened. Uh, to walk into this festival while I was doing my BA in uh, Applied Modern Languages in the city that I was born in, Sibiu. Um, this was in 2011. I was a volunteer translator back then, and every day I translated one or two articles for a daily publication of the festival. I did the same in 2012, and then in 2013 and 2014, I had moved to, to Cluj-Napoca, which is quite close, especially now that we have a highway. Um, and uh, for, for my uh, European masters in conference interpreting, I had a great group of colleagues there. And uh, I somehow, I don't know if convinced them is the right word, but anyway, I uh, managed to bring them over with me to Sibiu to work very enthusiastically, I have to say at the beginning at least, <laughs> uh, with me as interpreter volunteers in the same theater festival. And then in 2015, slowly but surely, I became translation coordinator and interpretation, of course. It's always a bit of an annex to, to translation, at least in Romania. And then we I added supertitling and subtitling, as I was saying. This happened until 2022, because now in 2023, I'm taking a bit of a step back. But let me tell you first and foremost, a couple of words about FITS. I'm now on, the, on my third slide. Hopefully they've been changing. So a couple of words about the festival. It's called, its name is uh, the Sibiu National Theater Festival. I think it was trademarked this way. So they still use this, uh, this name, but it's actually a performing arts festival. It takes place every year um, for many years now, and it, it's a 10 day long event for the audience, right? For the audience, it's a 10 day long event. Last year, uh, we had 3,500 participants, meaning actors, um, technicians, uh, dancers, um, guests from 75 countries, tens of thousands of, of people who are live at the festival, who attended the festival in person, and of course, tens of thousands of online viewers across several channels. Um, the digital stage is the festival's online platform where you can view theater shows and dance shows and so on. They also use YouTube to a certain extent. And last year I read that they used TikTok. I wasn't very much involved in that. So you get an idea of the kind of events we have in the festival theater, of course, modern, contemporary, classical theater and so on. Dance, music shows, uh, play readings, student shows, conferences. There's a gala, art exhibitions, street performances. We have the CB Walk of Fame. Sibiu Performing Arts Market and so on. And uh, some of the venues that um, where we have events are besides the, the more classical theater halls, cafes, churches, um, former industrial spaces that were turned into, into uh, performing arts spaces now, city squares and city streets, um, of course. You, you will see all this. I think my slide hadn't moved. So you can see all this on the slide. I'm sorry about that. All right. So in brief, we have people coming from all over Romania, or all over, from all over Europe and the world to see beautifully curated shows. It's mostly a curated festival. And of course, they all want to understand what's going on on stage, right? And it is, it is, it was actually my job to make sure that all audiences could understand what was going on. And when I refer to all audiences, I'm basically referring to two main segments, Romanian, so national audiences and international audiences. For the Romanian ones, we have 
Romanian super titles, subtitles, or interpretation. And for the international, we mainly have English. So that's the convention. Everybody should be able to, I know it, it, it should be much richer, but it's very difficult anyway to, to make sure people have access to the English uh, translation as well. Well, how do you think this happens? How do you think I managed to, to run the whole show, <laughs> the whole translation show? Of course, I have a team. I don't do a lot of it myself. Most of it, actually, I don't do. I, I, I always say I run a great email account and everything else. All the, the, <laughs> all the magic is done by my colleagues, of course. I will now show the next slide. Hopefully, okay. So you get an idea, get a picture of what this whole event translates into from a language point of view. Um, we um, before anything else, you should know we have a life uh, about fifty to sixty live performances every year. They come into different uh, from different uh, source languages, Romanian, of course, for the national performances, English, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Chinese, Japanese. We used to have Russian, not that much anymore. Um, and we have to translate all these to, to ensure that all these have a Romanian and an English version, unless they are already whether well in Romanian or in English. We also have hundreds of pages of PR material uh, to translate press re releases, website articles, brochures, uh, a lot of other kinds of materials, catalogs, um, all kinds of descriptions. And since 2020, since the pandemic, we've had dozens of shows and conferences that needed subtitling. And of course, every year during the festival itself, we have about 10 days of interpretation of events that require interpretation. Uh, the two tables that you see are a very simplified overview of what my, my job looks like at the beginning of the year and then after the festival. I know every December or January that I'm going to have about one or two months of planning. This partly overlaps uh, with the beginning of the activity of translation, uh, which um, takes up about six months, starting January, especially February, mostly. That's when the first plays come in. And then we start uh, translating, subtitling, supertitling, depending on, on every event. Then during the festival, I know this at the beginning of the year, that we're going to need subtitle, uh, supertitle, I'm sorry, operators during the 10 days of the festivals. The 10 days of interpretation, again, during the festival. And then at the beginning of the year, I already know I'm going to have about one month of post-event admin work. This means invoicing, um, feedback, payments, a lot of payments related um, activities. This is the more boring part of it. But anyway, it's a part of being a freelance and running a team of freelancers mostly. And then at the end of the festival, these are figures uh, from the 2022 edition, so last year's edition. We had about 20 to 25 translators. Uh, between 2,500 and 3,000 uh, pages translated, four supertitle operators, 60 supertitle files that they worked with. They either created them or operated them. Um, 20, this is again last year, because in the pandemic we had a lot of of subtitling, but then after the pandemic ended and uh, people started going back to, to the festival in person, we no longer streamed as many, the festival no longer streamed as many performances because people really wanted to be there in person. I think there's a Zoom fatigue or whatever, digital stage fatigue that would be. So we only had about 20 shows or conferences that were subtitled. Those amount to 1,769 minutes, 13 conference interpreters working from various languages. I think last year we had, of course, Romanian, English, French, German. I don't know if we had Spanish, but we had Italian. And 54 events that were interpreted. This includes shows, theater shows. Um, 
conferences, of course, the gala and, and so on. All right. And now I'm going to, to move into the um, actual work. I've tried to put together a couple of questions that I thought could be of interest to you, but I'm open to other questions. So if you have them, please post them in the chat or maybe at the end. If, if only if I don't go over my time, we, we will be able to have a conversation. So some of the, the traps of working in a theater um, or some of the challenges, right, uh, rather. And I'm, I've divided this into three main chapters, translation and supertitling or translation for supertitling. Then, of course, we're, we're going to talk about translation and and for subtitling and a bit about interpretation. I'm not sure if that's of great interest, so I, I'll try not to insist on that. So that's my favorite part, really. <laughs> um, all right, so you can see here on this slide, uh, it's a dark picture, I know. I, I took it in a, during a theater show, and I didn't have much light there. But you can see, you should be able to see somebody crouched over a lap top there and above her head you can see well can't really read but you can probably see the white uh two lines it was probably white uh writing it was probably a show that was in english and was only translated into romanian so some of the questions that i have uh here is theater translation the same as literary translation and from my point of view it is up to a certain extent, it's a form of literary translation, right? Because a play is first and foremost a genre of literature. But then translating for super titles to me is different than translating for um, a, translating a play to publish it in a book. Because, for instance, in a book, you have the luxury of uh, footnotes of space simply because you can use an expression rather than one word to, to say the same thing because you don't have the constraints of, um, of two lines or uh, slide and so on. So you need or I needed to find uh, the right translators, people who are interested in this field of work, um, then to help them understand, especially I'm talking about the newer translation who joined the team later on, help them understand field specificities. For instance, in theater, characters often address each other directly. And in Romanian, we don't use um, the, the politeness form as much uh, in um, theater as we use it in uh, public speech, for instance, right? So uh, there are certain pronoun and verb forms that should be avoided. and it takes a while to transition into that if you haven't worked in theater before then uh, my my colleagues often had questions about who's talking to who who's this character who's the other character who's replying um what's their gender again uh, another issue that we have in romanian well issue it's not that bit big of an issue but you need to establish certain things because we have three grammatical genders whereas in english it's always you talking to you or and you don't often know even if it's about an object you don't often know if it's a female object in Romanian or if it's a male object and how do you use your pronouns with that plus another big thing uh, for me is putting yourself the translator the interpreter the subtitler in the shoes of the character first of all and then in the shoes of the spectator this is something that I always insist on because I think this is basically key to, to uh, sending, to conveying your message in a way that's useful and faithful, useful to, to the recipient and faithful to the original. And of course, I also had to learn who was good at what. And basically, I tried to give them more of that. If I had a colleague who enjoyed working with Shakespeare texts, I tried to send all the Shakespeare texts her way. If I had somebody who enjoyed translating poetry or poetry style texts, I would try to send those her away, of course, uh, as long as uh, language combinations uh, allowed that. Then um, there's also the, the, the issue of classical versus modern plays. 
because you can have a very classical Shakespeare play, which you can translate by going back to the two, three translations that are well established in Romania, uh, in Romanian. Um, and you can use those, especially because they raise no copyright issues. That's the good thing about classical texts. But can you use those when you have a modern take on a Shakespeare play? Not really, not so much. You can use those, of course, to get the context to see some of the words, but then you'll have to rephrase most of it so that it's easier to, to read because the original is easier to read to the native English speaker if the play is in English, of course. And then we have the totally modern plays where we have other issues related to copyright, first and foremost. So can you use the existing translation of a play by Eric Emanuel Schmidt, for instance? because he's been translated into Romanian or and into English if the original is in French. We've had a case last year and I don't think my colleague was able to use the existing translation because we didn't have the copy, copyright. Uh, you have to talk to the, the original translator, but more than that, oftentimes you have to talk to, to the publishing house because they are the ones who hold, especially in Romania, who tend to hold the, the copyright over that translation. And all this going back and forth uh, takes a lot of time. Oftentimes you don't have the time to engage in dialogue with the translator, then with the publishing house. And um, for the theater, well, my client actually to sign a contract with uh, the publishing house and then to use that, it's much easier to get the author's agreement to retranslate that text for the super titles. So that's how that's how it it goes in in the case of modern plays, especially. I talked already about parallel versions. You can use as reference existing translations to as reference or use them if again, if you have a, a text that's very close to the original in the case of a Shakespeare play, you can use the Gutenberg version. They are available online. Uh, sometimes if they are scanned, badly scanned, you might have to type the translation, but yeah, you can use that. Another thing that I try to, to facilitate, yeah, I have a question, sorry, I, I'm going to stop for the question. Do you have the opportunity, somebody so, says, to work with a video of the performance while creating the super titles? That's a great question. There's been, from my experience, a huge division pre and after the pandemic. Before the pandemic, theaters and performing arts companies didn't really have recordings or uh, weren't very keen on sharing them. It was always a bit of a struggle. What you should know is that I had negotiated with my client, the National Theater in, in Sibiu, which is organizing the festival, to be in direct contact with the companies because otherwise I would have to go through uh, somebody else who is uh, an employee at the theater. They wouldn't have time in February to deal with my queries and so on. So I, I uh, finally got into contact with the companies. But before the pandemic, I, I met a lot of resistance there. After the pandemic, everybody had, um, or most, 90% maybe of the companies that I worked with had um, videos of the performances, and I have to say they got better and better starting the second half of 2020 and then 2021, because before the pandemic, if they had a recording, it would be unifocal, so they basically planted a camera bef um, uh, behind the audience. Um, the, the actors oftentimes wouldn't be wearing microphones, so it would be very, very hard for us to hear what was being spoken. So that was clearly an archive type of recording just so they had, I don't know, proof that that show existed or something. It was largely unusable otherwise. So yeah, that was the most fortunate and is the most fortunate case, but you don't often get that. And especially if you get a, you get a play to be translated at the end of May, you don't only get one, just so you know the peak of our work is, um, I don't know, from the 15th of May all the way up to the festival. So it's largely a month where you get not really half, but close to half of the, the work. So you don't have as much time to spend asking for these. Um, 
the companies also need to get permission from a lot of people. So at some point, you just don't do it. But what you do is, and here we, we go to the last bullet point that I have there, the subtitle operators go to rehearsals. That's something that I can control. The companies want them there. And even if they don't want them there, they cannot kick them out. They, they're going to be there and do their job uh, and uh, make sure that they at least have the chance to go through the whole performance, to follow the whole performance of a rehearsal once, meaning they have the chance to make um, some changes if necessary. They are all, they all have a linguistic background, so they they can make uh, slight adjustments. And of course, they can be in contact with the translators if uh, they realize that, I don't know, that the play has changed because sometimes this happens. Uh, a play is, uh, or a show is built in, I don't know, 2018, and they, they then they play it for a year or so, they stop, and then they come with it to the festival and realize that a lot of changes have had to be made. So that happens quite a lot. Thanks for the question. And client interaction is something that I used to do a lot. I try to shield, if you want, my colleagues from that because it's a time-consuming activity. Uh, I learned being a translator myself and working with my colleagues closely. I learned what kind of questions they might ask me when they or they might have um, when they started working on a certain show. So I try to to um, come up with a list of questions myself for the company before I, I even sent the text to my colleague for translation. So I would try to feed them as much information as they, they uh, could get. Uh, and of course, if they had further questions later on, once they started working at or at the end of their translation, uh, I could uh, talk to the, to the company or I could even uh, put them in contact and just get out of their hair because they, they knew the play better than I do. And maybe another question that you might have, uh, I know a lot of people ask me, do you use TMs? I don't know, STL, Trados, MemoQ, whatever, in, uh, in uh, working for the theater? And the answer is a big yes, but I, I use it personally. When working for plays, I use it because it simply divides my text very conveniently. Uh, and there's no chance for me to, I don't know, jump or to, to, to uh, miss a line and, and, uh, or an answer or something there just because my eyes were tired or so on. But otherwise, a TM isn't, from my point of view, very useful in these kinds of texts. Because just to give you a simple answer, even if you have to translate yes or no, you might get a hit from the memory that has nothing to do with your context. I would, I might try to adapt that yes into an exactly, well, the Romanian equivalent, or of course, depending on what I need in that context, what kind of character I'm dealing with and, and so on. So TMs in theater play translation, from my point of view, is not very useful other than defining your screen. Otherwise, I do use TMs a lot uh, with press releases because they tend to have a certain structure, presentation of the theater or of the festival, and it's great for me to, to just get those half, to get half of the press release there. And then at the end, of course, we always had information about how people could access the box office, the address of the box office, the schedule. Uh, all that was very easy for me to just, I don't know, use from the, from, use from the TM. Okay, and just another note on subtitle operators. Um, I don't know if you've, you've probably had the interaction with them, so you know what they do largely. In our case, what they did was they prepared the files for subtitling. We use PowerPoint. It's a client requirement. Don't get me started. And they would also attend rehearsals, make certain changes, as I, as I told you. Just make sure, for instance, that the audience doesn't see the punchline of a joke, joke before it's delivered by the actor on stage. Yeah, so make sure that that everybody gets the message at the same time, if possible. All right, I'll move on to my next slide, translation and subtitling. Okay, what you can see in this picture here is an actual live um, 
uh, subtitling that a colleague was doing in the pandemic when schools were closed and she had to, I don't know, with one hand translate and with the other <laughs> care for her daughter <laughs> who was there learning <laughs> how to subtitle. I hear she was quite bored in a couple of minutes and she left. So, <laughs> yeah. Now, the same structure of the slide. How do we do we work with uh, with uh, translation for subtitling? Is theater translation for subtitling the same as film translation? Well, to a certain extent, yeah, you have a audiovisual material and you have to subtitle it. That's one way to look at it. But then, first and foremost, films are made differently uh, and divided into frames differently than theater is. Um, even though theaters have started to get more professional in the field, our uh, theater, for instance, has hired or collaborates, I don't know what they do, uh, with, a, um, with a film director. He was a film director before that. So he now produces something that is somewhere between film and theater. Is more, it's more, much more professional than those unifocal recordings they had at the beginning, but um, it's not really a film. It's a bit different. Um, then so you also have, um, yeah, I, I see your, your question there, working as a subtitler or supertitler. I'd like to ask why PowerPoint is obligatory. Yes, there are many tools, it's true, but um, in Romania, I think we're not very advanced with the whole subtitling, supertitling. Uh, and I think this is just something that's a heritage, if you want, that's just been used and I've met certain resistance in changing that. And I have, I've had many other things to focus on. I chose not to, to go, to push that much into that direction. It was something that my team already knew how to do, what, how to use. Uh, it was easy to be used on all the computers because you should know the theater doesn't work in, um, I don't know, 50 something venues throughout the year just for the 10 days of the festival. And so they bring in more computers that I think are rented. I'm not sure if they are rented. But anyway, you have computers that, that come, up, come in with all kinds of windows uh, installed on them. And PowerPoint, I think, is quite easy to, to use there. All the technicians that are brought in more or less know how to use it. And then my colleagues are trained in that. There are certain companies that choose to use other software, but then in that case, it's their responsibility in the whole operating and everything is their responsibility. We work with them beforehand, we deliver the translation in the format that they require, but then they operate it, uh, they normally use their own computers and so on. So different companies come in with different experiences and with different degrees of involvement in the subtitling, supertitling. Some of them don't care, some of them are very much involved and even reach out to me before I get the chance to reach out to them. So it depends a lot. And, but th that's largely the reason one, why we stick to, to PowerPoint. I know it's not ideal, I know, but you have to make some compromise and it's, it hasn't been the time yet for me to, to push in that direction. Um, I see another longer question. Maybe we could... Uh, we could discuss that at the end because I, I can't focus on it right now. Thank you so much. Okay, going back to supertitling now versus subtitling. Subtitling, from my experience, again, is a bit a more, uh, comes with more constraint than supertitling because in supertitling, you can play a little with the fonts if you really need to and you don't really want to, to divide the sentence into two slides. Whereas in subtitling, you really, really have to rephrase. You really have to, to make sure that you can fit within those 41, 42 characters they are. I don't know exactly. Another interesting thing for me was, a very practical thing for me to find out was the copyright issue. Because it's a bit different when you present a, a cultural work to the whole world on the internet. Whereas when you present the same work, in a closed venue with a limited audience. And I, I know this has, uh, has been a bit of a reshuffle in the whole cultural sector because everybody thought, well, we'll just 
put the show online because we have the director's agreement, the theater company's agreement, we have a contract between us. But then they would discover that they used, a, let's say, Beyonce song in the show. And they didn't have the copyright from Beyonce to use that beyond that uh, particular venue. So YouTube, for instance, would take it down. Nobody, it wasn't the person who took the decision, but rather AI who would say, you are trying, you are breaching copyright, la la la, and you'd be, you, you would basically take your show down and we'd close your account for 30 days. And then in those 30 days, a person would come in and it basically went all after the festival, somebody would analyze the whole situation and realize, yeah, maybe we could have been able to publish your show too late. So copyright was a bit different and hard to tackle right then. And then use of TMs in the case of a subtitling file, you know, you can import them in STL, MemoQ and others. Um, so if you already had, a, we used .srt um, files, if you already had one of those, in let's say we you translated it from French into Romanian, you had the Romanian subtitling in a .srt file. You could just uh, import that into SDL and work on the English translation, and then just do a bit of adjustments. Oh, though you didn't have to re-synchronize everything. It's so much easier in this case. All right, and then I'll go over interpretation quickly if powerpoints yeah works with me interpretation um we have uh, you have to take several things into account when planning for this for instance who are the speakers who's the moderator what kind of we had uh more or less the same moderators for all conferences some of them were fast but very organized time-wise Others were slower and didn't care so much about time, switched from one language into the other. We had this case that happened often from Romanian into French and from French into Romanian in the same sentence. If you've worked in a booth with relay, because you have two booths taking relay from each other, that's hell. <laughs> because at some point you wouldn't know what button to press, what to do, what you should be listening to. Uh, that was a very steep, quick learning curve for me. I knew when I had that moderator, even in the English booth, I would need people who spoke French, just so buttons wouldn't be an issue anymore. Then oftentimes, because this is a very cultural event, we'd have people reciting poetry, which is a joy to interpret, sense the irony, um, of course. Uh, one of the big speakers, the most important, the, the VIPs, if you want, of the festival would do this frequently. So we'd have to work with him. He, luckily, he understood most of the times that he need, needed to tell us what that he was going to recite a poem, what poem ideally, and uh, tell that to us beforehand. And just in case we have a pretty big uh, Google Doc file with several poems in Romanian, English, and French, which are the, uh, the the working languages that we use most, just in case, and that's always open on uh, next to the glossary, it's always open on our computers, just in case. Um, and of course, you have a lot of cultural references that you need to know, authors and uh, names of shows and so on. After many years, you do get used to those. Um, all right, the tech has to, the tech department has to be on your team. They they control, remember, I always say this to, to my uh, colleagues, young colleagues, remember the techies control the microphone. So worst case scenario, I, I didn't have to use that yet, but should I need to, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I could convince them to unplug those for a couple of seconds. <laughs> this is a joke, of course, <laughs> this never happens. They would probably not do it. Uh, a big thing for, for interpreters though is recording. We've had cases of, the press coming in and saying, yeah, you know, I have a voice recorder. Could I just put it in your booth? Of course, we would protest. They wouldn't understand and so on. We'd have, have to, to negotiate a little bit with them. In the end, the negotiation ended up with uh, in a clause in our contract saying we uh, record interpreting for the archive. The press can use the interpretation, but from the techies press box, I think it's called, so they can plug in their their voice recorders there 
So when we turn off our mic to discuss terminology, for instance, they don't hear our, they don't record our discussion there. Uh, I don't, certainly don't want the press writing something when they don't have a topic for discussion, writing uh, about how one of my colleagues didn't know how to, to, to translate, I don't know which word, into, into Romanian or into English and so on. Because that would, would end up spiral down actually in a, a largely useless discussion that the general audience might not have the context to understand. All right, and of course, we, we also negotiated when and if the, um, the interpretation could be used for radio shows, for instance, because sometimes radio shows are live um, streamed from the festival. All right, so this is largely about interpretation and a couple of words about my work for uh, about manager management, management of the team, if you want, or the, the translation. In uh, interpret at, uh, activity at large. Be careful with overlapping roles. As I was telling you, I was both a translator, an interpreter, subtitler, supertitler, and uh, the interface for my team and for the end client. And of course, their end clients, the companies, the theater companies. Sometimes it was hard to explain to some people that, okay, now I'm just in my management role. I cannot go in a booth and interpret, or now I'm in the booth. I cannot answer the phone and talk to you about a show that's going to happen five days from now. Um, even if it was an emergency, I had to find to find ways to deal with all that. Luckily, my, my colleagues were very understanding and they would actually take the, the, take the floor, take the mic and let me get out and speak on the phone. But it's, it's something to, to keep track of and uh, keep in your mind when you, when you're in this kind of work. Look after your team, I said, just make sure everybody in your team has what they need, they are happy, just every now and then organize, I don't know, a de-stressing, a glass of wine if you want. In the festival, we would meet because otherwise for the six months largely that we'd work, we would all be in different cities at home or wherever we worked. Um, but during the festivals, the ones of us who came to, to Sibiu, as Dragos and Dalina did, for instance, would meet up and see each other. As you know, translation can be a lonely activity. And then, of course, keep your eyes, eyes right on the ball. The ball, in my case, in my mind, being making sure that the spectators who spoke different languages laughed and cried at the same time during the show. So... This is, this is it from, from me. Uh, this is my thank you with a picture from the festival. One of the festival, brilliant festival photographers took it after a show that took place on a pouring rain in a public square. And as you can see, nobody left. People stayed there. It was, it was great. And we have this great picture. So this is my, my thank you to you on a snowy, I see, day from Sibiu here. Thanks so much. And I'm here for questions, please. And my contact details, if you need. Thank you very much, uh, Camelia. Now that we, we know how many balls or roughly how many balls you have to juggle. Um, maybe you want to, do you want to take the question that was already in the in the chat? The rather- the one from Emmanuel, the longer mm -hmm. one, yes. Create a committee and ask if a literary specialist with critical thinking has helped you with the terminology during the festival, because in theater and literature, we have many symbols and some kind of myths that should be accurate uh, further translated. Romanian literature has a traditional way inspired by folklore. Yes, thank you for the question, Emmanuel. We, when I started as a volunteer, I had no help. Um, a bit of context for those of you who haven't worked in, in Romania as translators, interpreters, normally clients don't tend to know. It, I know it's not only a Romanian thing, but I, I guess especially with interpretation, it's more obvious here. They don't really know what you need and why you need certain things. And they tend to assume you just translate, you just take a word and replace it for another in the other language in both translation and interpretation. So at the beginning, I didn't get anything, any support because I was a volunteer. I was very young. I didn't know how to how to tackle the, the issue. I just I was trying to find my way too. So I started really, really small anyway back then. But I did 
ask around when I, I had problems with the terminology that I encountered back then. In the meantime, as everything has developed, yes, we did have access to specialists. We did. Everybody who comes to the, to the festival is a specialist. It's either a theater critic, a theater director, actor, and so on. So they do come with BAs, MAs, whatever they do in uh, theater or directing or any related uh, job. Um, so we had access to them and we could talk to them. Oftentimes I had the luxury of asking the company to ask the director and so on further on to do it until you go to the source. What do you mean in this context? I remember, for instance, a text that was in French originally and had uh, some very specific um, fragment. There was a very specific fragment about Mandrake that basically made no sense to my colleague who is doing the translation. And she went back to the company and the company explained the folklore meaning or the folkloric meaning of Mandrake in French. And then she came into Romanian and she had to look and see if, whether we had the same more or less folklore about Mandrake. It, Mandrake is not really something that you know of. For instance, if it hadn't been for the Harry Potter movies, I wouldn't basically know what it was. It's a plant. Uh, and apparently in folklore, it means a lot of things, but it's, it's not meanings that overlap between countries and languages. So they had to adapt that a little bit into Romanian. Although we were surprised to find we had more or less a shared understanding in folklore about Mandra of Mandrake. But then you also have to adapt that because the modern audience may not know that meaning for folklore. So keep your audience in mind. You may add a little bit of an explanation that, an, I don't know, my mother, for instance, who might know what Mandrake was used for 40 years ago, uh, would find a little bit redundant, but without which the, the younger audience, my age or even younger, wouldn't get that, that fragment. So that's how we relate to experts. And of course, over time, we've developed an, um, an, a glossary with the more technical terms, even directing, for instance, director directing is a technical term. We might know it, but then outside of it, outside of this small world, people would only think a director is somebody who manages a company. So you have to, to make sure you have the, that distinction. The same with interpreter. Sometimes I'm so focused on an interpreter being a language interpreter, the, the things that I do, that I, I tend to need a second to realize that an interpreter can also be an actor or a dancer or somebody who interprets a play or whatever. So this, this would be my answer. Hopefully I've answered your, your question, Emmanuel. If not, you can contact me if you want to. You've had my, my email or just write me not on Twitter I'm not on Twitter sorry <laughs> sorry about that but just reach out 